Hello, I'm Marites Vitug, and this is Worldview, where we take a look at global, regional, and national affairs in conversations with officials, newsmakers, and analysts. Joining us is India's Ambassador to the Philippines, Ambassador Shambu Kumaran. We will be talking about the seemingly newfound friendship between our countries. Welcome to the show, Ambassador. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I think we'll start with uh, your recent speech in July, mm -hmm. uh, during the seventh anniversary of the Philippine victory versus China on the South China Sea, wherein you said that India and the Philippines are in their best phase ever of their relationship. Can you describe this best phase and what led to this? Well, I think a confluence of factors. Uh, primarily, of course, there's uh, a desire on the part of the Philippines to look at uh, new partnerships over the past decade or so, coinciding with India's active effort to act east policy of uh, Prime Minister Modi, which has been seeking to build a broader relationships with countries of the east. And obviously, as a member of ASEAN, as a leading member of ASEAN, the Philippines is an important element of that policy. Uh, the new emerging architecture of the Indo-Pacific, the Philippines centrally located here, and India's vital interest in, in this region, are growing economic ties. Uh, I would say a uh, culmination of also a process of relationship building over the years, uh, where we've had a lot of trade, investment, uh, engagement uh, between our people. And there are also fundamental factors because we are both uh, democracies. Uh, we have very young populations. And we are uh, internationalist in our outlook. So it's all driving this uh, new dynamic phase of the partnership. In, your, in the Act East policy, uh, I've read that India has more advanced relations with countries like in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam and Singapore. Uh, how come... They are more, theirs are more advanced than the Philippines? Well, uh, obviously, Singapore, we've had a very close relationship for a very uh, considerable period of time. Uh, it's been a center for Indians moving out to you know, visit various other parts, including uh, transit to various other countries. It, there's been a large Indian involvement, an Indian community in Singapore. Uh, Vietnam, again, I think uh, is a case where India has had ties during the uh, decades after independence where we both mirrored each other's efforts to create uh, national identities. So each relationship is different. And I, I would say the perhaps the energy in the India-Philippines relationship didn't uh, match some of the other relationships, but substantively there was interaction. I, I wouldn't want to suggest that we were mm -hmm. not interacting, <laughs> but perhaps the new dynamism is somewhat of a, of a refreshing change. And also, what's significant, uh, well, to, to the Philippines, is that um, India just recently endorsed the arbitral award which the Philippines won in 2016. Uh, initially, India noted uh, the arbitral award, but in the 2023 statement, it endorsed uh, this arbitral award. What happened? Why seven years later? <laughs> well, I, I, I think traditionally India's approach to issues between other countries is not to get very uh, publicly uh, prescriptive about how the country should approach these issues. But sometimes uh, in the course of uh, you know, the development of the issue, sometimes you need to take a slightly more forward-leaning position because of the, the way in which the situation is evolving. And as I was mentioning, uh, and uh, as you noted in the joint statement, we did uh, strongly endorse the need mm -hmm. for this award to be respected. But we also feel that uh, there's a larger issue around the behavior of states, uh, mm -hmm. especially larger states, and how their actions should contribute to stability rather than detract from it. Because India is now the most populous, populous nation on earth, and you have uh, out, uh, you eclipse China's population. Is that 
um, and I think your economy is growing fast. So that makes you, that gives you a lot of clout uh, here in Southeast Asia and in the rest of the world. So do you see, do you see India as, um, you know, competing with China, at least in the region, as one of the, you know, big powers? Well, I, we see our, our trajectory as being uh, very strong in its own right. We've obviously had uh, a certain structure of governance, which is democratic and participatory. And sometimes decision-making can be a little more uh, prolonged because of that. But we also feel that decisions taken through participatory processes lead to more sustainable outcomes. And uh, governments are more accountable to the people in their actions. So, yes, you're right. Our uh, population is, uh, is now the largest in the world, according to the United Nations estimates. We uh, also have uh, an exceedingly uh, fast-growing economy, uh, arguably the fastest-growing large economy in the world. And uh, we are being driven by what the Prime Minister calls the three Ds of democracy, demand, and demography. We have a young population, growing domestic demand, and a democratic culture that uh, fosters innovation, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, foreign sec when uh, the Philippine Foreign Secretary Manalo visited Delhi in June, um, I went over some of the reports of the English language Indian press, and they were quite enthusiastic and optimistic about relations between the Philippines and India. And one TV talk show host, who happens to be an academic, gushed at the end of, towards the end of the show, and he said, the Philippines is an undiscovered gem in India's act is policy. Did they suddenly, did India suddenly realize that the Philippines is important or is, is exciting? I, I, I think as I was mentioning, it's the emer there is the emergence of the Philippines as a, as a more important actor in the region. You are... Your economy is growing quite dynamically. Your population is uh, growing. You have a very young population. And uh, Filipinos are uh, globally deployed and known for their skills and in particular for their empathy. And you have established yourself in various sectors. So obviously there, is, there has been less visibility uh, for Philippines in India earlier. That visibility has in increased considerably, which might perhaps have led him to use that term. <laughs> But I definitely do believe that there is a significant momentum, uh, but also a lot of potential still that we need to explore. Ambassador, can you talk to us about uh, maritime cooperation between our countries? I saw you a, f a week or so ago, you visited the Philippine Coast Guard, and I was surprised because it, it was soon after Secretary Manalo came from Delhi, and there was an agreement for maritime cooperation. And there you were already starting to um, work on it. <laughs> yes. So we, we have identified maritime affairs as a focus area of our partnership. We've agreed to set up a maritime affairs dialogue, which, is, which will also have a track two component. And we've uh, had uh, ongoing engagement between our navies, Indian ships do come here, and we've had interactions with the Navy, which we want to increase. We are uh, actively pursuing an MOU on enhanced maritime cooperation with the Coast Guard. We hope that the Coast Guard commandant will be able to undertake a visit to India soon to sign that MOU. Uh, we have an exchange of white shipping information agreement, which is uh, to also to be activated uh, as a consequence of his visit. Uh, focusing on maritime domain awareness and sharing information. Uh, so uh, really, we do see the uh, maritime sector as something that unites us as a bridge that connects our two uh, very, shall we say, uh, ocean-reliant economies. And the blue economy has become very, very important uh, and is going to gain in importance. We've done also uh, work connecting academic institutions. For example, the Indian Maritime University signed an MOU with the Batanga State University. Mm -hmm. Uh, on cooperation in various areas related to the blue economy. So it's a multifaceted engagement. Uh, and uh, clearly, maritime security is of top concern to both our countries. But we do see the larger impact in terms of looking at the blue economy, in terms of climate change, uh, managing the health of our oceans, uh, talking about all the issues that come in there about, about fishing, about resources, 
So, we really uh, see and of course, one interesting thing is that uh, Indians and Filipinos are present across the merchant marine fleet worldwide. Yes. So, it's a natural fit for us to talk about those issues as well, things that relate to uh, countries that provide the manpower for this uh, for the sector. So, really there's a lot uh, of uh, areas of engagement within this sector. In what forms of cooperation do you foresee between our coast guards? Uh, we've never had any cooperation, right? Between our coast we, guards. We have not had very active cooperation in the past. Nothing structured and effective mm -hmm. uh, enough, I would say. We have had Indian Coast Guard ships that have come here. We've had, mm -hmm. for example, last year, the Philippine Coast Guard for the first time sent its officials to India for training programs. We want to sustain that. And the Coast Guard of uh, Philippine Coast Guard also sent an observer to the search and rescue exercise that we held with the Indian Coast Guard. So we want to broaden the uh, interface between our Coast Guards to share experiences. And we also uh, offered some of the equipment that is in the Indian uh, Defense Establishment, the Coast Guard Establishment for consideration of the Philippines Coast Guard. As I said, information sharing and you know, maritime domain awareness is an important part of this engagement. So it's it uh, covers capability building, capacity building, exchange of best practices. When it comes to defense cooperation, I mean, there was a milestone, uh, 2022? January 22, yes. Yeah, you know the exact date. <laughs> when the Philippines uh, bought the BrahMos uh, anti-missile system. And um, the Philippines is expecting a delivery this year. Uh, can you please update us? on we, what to expect. We, uh, we did sign that uh, path-breaking agreement. It was a significant uh, decision on, both on the part of both governments, reflected the growing strategic trust between our countries. We are on course to, uh, to implement that agreement uh, and you know, affect the supplies in a timely manner. I don't have a specific time frame, but we're still hopeful that the deliveries can commence in 2023 as scheduled. And the Philippines was the first country to buy, the, right? It, yes, from, correct. It's, from it's extensively deployed in India, and the uh, uh, Philippines was the first foreign, foreign customer. Yes. Customer, yes. And um, under under Prime Minister Mo Modi, uh, um, uh, India is apparently tilting towards the U.S. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I just listened or I read his speech, Prime Minister Modi's speech before the U.S joint session of the U.S. Congress, and he talked of another kind of AI, not artificial intelligence, but America and India. Can you talk about the evolution of this policy? Or anyway, um, just to let us know where India stands, because India has always been non-aligned or non-allied. Yeah, so the India-USA uh, relationship uh, was not at its best during the Cold War years. There were several cases of uh, where we did not see uh, you know, each other's perspectives were, were not matching. But I think since the opening of the Indian economy and the end of the Cold War, there's been a very uh, serious effort from both sides to build this partnership. It has grown exponentially over the past years. Uh, we have uh, developed a very broad-based economic relationship, a lot of uh, companies from the United States are investing in India. Indian companies are investing in the United States. There's uh, across sectors from uh, agriculture to health to space. There's a, a range of engagement uh, between India and the United States today. And defense cooperation has also emerged and security cooperation has emerged as a key area. Of course, in each, we have a strong counterterrorism cooperation because we have shared concerns on terrorism. And in the emerging construct of the Indo-Pacific, we are both countries that are natural partners as democracies that share the same values and who, uh, who cherish the idea that peace and stability in this region will lead to greater prosperity and well-being for everyone. So we'd like to see uh, an orderly and structured uh, emergence of the, of the Indo-Pacific. So these are fundamental factors that are driving uh, India's policy to the United States, and I think the United States is reciprocated in full measure. Uh, it's really a very strong partnership in progress. Uh, having said that, I think it, it does not really, 
you know, imply there's any exclusivity in our partnership with any one country. We really want to build a range of international partnerships. A country of India's size will have an interest, will have to necessarily build multiple relationships. And we'd also like to uh, explore the full potentiality of the India-United States relationship. So how are your relations with China at this point? I mean, India became a part of Quad, although it's a very loose uh, grouping, uh, but still it, it's seen as moving towards the West. How are your relations with, with China? Well, w with China, we, uh, as you may be aware, historically we've had some complications, yeah. uh, especially over the boundary. And uh, we did have a set of mechanisms in place where we were able to manage the boundary question at the same time build our partnership in other areas, especially on the economic side. And there were areas you know, on international issues where we, where we work together uh, as large emerging economies. Uh, but I think there have been certain developments over the recent past which have affected the smooth development of India-China relations. And uh, my leadership has been on record to say that we need to address those issues, particularly what's happened in 2020 the summer of 2020 in our border where there were casualties. So we, we do feel that uh, that has affected the tenor and the, and the natural progression of the relationship and it needs to be addressed because it has created uh, a lot of public sentiment in India about this partnership which the government will need to factor in as it builds the, the relationship. We do have uh, still a very strong set of uh, engagements with China and uh, the, there is a dialogue that is underway. And I do hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, make some significant progress in addressing the anomalies that have crept into the partnership. And uh, India, of course, is known uh, for its non-aligned position, and some say non-allied position. And some even describe the foreign policy of India as strategic ambiguity or strategic autonomy. I want to know your thoughts. Is there a, are we putting India in a box here or uh, how should we? Yeah, I think these labels tend to kind of <laughs> work on some preconceived notions that you have to be tilting this way or you have to yeah. be in this box or the other. I think if I were to look at India's foreign policy, uh, two things would stand out. Of course, one is that India has uh, always been a very strong contributor to the global good. Uh, if you look at several of the new initiatives under the Modi government, for example, whether it is to do with the popularization of yoga worldwide, mm -hmm. that's to do with the Solar Alliance, the Coalition on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, and contributing to the larger discussions on climate change, on global governance, I think uh, we want to be seen to, uh, we want to act as a country that contributes to global peace, stability, and prosperity. Uh, so we are, I think, uh, aligned towards the global good, and we are uh, also aligned to what is in India's interests, uh, so that we have uh, a fundamental responsibility to ensure the well-being and progress of our population. There is still a large developmental deficit in terms of our own population. So our policies have to reflect, for example, on the question of energy supplies, etc., has to reflect on the impact that some of our decisions will have in terms of our domestic economy and especially how it affects the bottom half of the pyramid of our population. So uh, it's difficult, as I was saying earlier, to try and put India's foreign policy into a box and stick a label on it. We are definitely uh, pursuing a multifaceted foreign policy based on India's interests, but also fundamentally uh, trying to contribute towards global progress. I like that, the com uh, Global Good Solar Alliance and yoga. <laughs> and uh, India has, I think, the largest diaspora among all countries. And a lot of Indians are doing very well in IT and leading companies. Maybe just a bit about your India's involvement here in IT, because it's one of the growing fields. And we're not competing, right? Are we? Not at all. <laughs> I, in fact, this, this, uh, I'm, I'm happy you raised this question. Uh, India's BPO success story and the Philippines success story are uh, sort of co-evolving uh, e in terms of their trajectories. 
So that shows that we are not competing. And uh, I was at the contact center conference in Cebu mm -hmm. a couple of uh, weeks ago. And what was very clear was that there's no competition in terms of supply. It's about trying to meet the demand, which is still mm -hmm. growing. So this is a growing sector. Indian companies have invested very heavily in the Philippines in this sector. There are uh, nearly 30 to 40 companies that are directly employing uh, more than 200,000 mm -hmm. Filipinos. And of course, there are Indians who are also present uh, as the representatives of US-based companies mm -hmm. uh, in the Philippines. So it's, this involvement is very deep, and I think it's very profoundly and positively impacting the Philippines economy and also India-Philippines relations. I see. So IT is your number one? It's a number one... Uh, I mean, India is heavily invested in the IT sector here. Absolutely. How about in terms of medicine, uh, health? Yes, it's a very important area of our cooperation. Uh, I, uh, you know, I would like to see, describe it as India contributing to Philippines health security because by providing high quality, affordable medicines, we have really made it possible for the average Filipino to access these pharmaceutical products, which would have otherwise been far more expensive. So we are a big supplier of pharmaceuticals, and we have a broad-based engagement on health. There are Indian companies that are looking at coming into the Philippines in the healthcare space. Uh, medical devices is another area. And we've also recently introduced a degree of uh, engagement on Ayurveda and traditional medicine. We signed an MOU between the National Institute of Ayurveda and the Philippines Institute of Traditional Healthcare. And this, uh, we had a delegation coming into Philippines uh, last, uh, I think, June, and the discussions were very good. We are trying to also contribute to developing the pharmacopoeia and the capabilities of the Philippines traditional medicine, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, really, uh, you know, growth has to be uh, taking both sides, and uh, this traditional knowledge fee, uh, develops further when you have an open approach to including other elements of the of the knowledge that is shared by traditional communities. I think one final question, Ambassador. Next year will be the 75th year anniversary of Philippine-India relations. Yes. How, what do we expect? Is there anything? What, do you, what are your thoughts about well, it's this? a landmark year, absolutely. It it's, uh, uh, reflects the uh, fact that both India and the Philippines also gained their full independence at around the same time. Uh, we have... Uh, we are working towards a series of activities, a, ce a celebration of our partnership to celebrate in particular the people-to-people -people relationship, which is also very, very significant as to democracies to, to, to reaffirm to our people the value of this partnership. So there will be a series of cultural activities. I would expect lots of visits, exchange of visits, uh, conferences, uh, there would be commemorative events. Uh, we would we hope to market in a, in a very meaningful manner. Yes. So we look forward to 2024. And as you said earlier, uh, we also like Indian food. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting so you mention it because that like, when I came in the, in, Ju in the middle of 2020, oh, there the were pandemic. about three or four Indian restaurants in Manila, but now they are close to 15 to 20 of them. 15 to 20? So the growth has been quite rapid. Some of their Restaurants uh, which had one branch now have two or three branches. So the Filipinos are, I think, had a misconception that Indian food is too spicy, but now <laughs> they're discovering the many, uh, you know, flavors of Indian food. Yeah. On that uh, positive note, uh, thank you, Ambassador, for making time for this interview. And to our audience and listeners, this has been Worldview with Marites Vitug. Thank you.